My question is for Hans. Uh, you were talking about gang A fighting gang B and the preference for just being neutral, um, particularly when there's conscription being attempted and those sorts of things. So I just want you to clarify that point. If you look at England in the First World War, there were many conscientious objectors who did do that, most famously Bertrand Russell, and a lot of, did, a lot of good it did him. But the criticism of them by their fellows would be Gang B, the Germans, if we all just do that, we'll just be invaded by Germany. We, we won't be able to negotiate a decent peace. We will just lose. And the idea that being run by Germany might be no worse than being run by the British is, didn't appeal to that many people. So I, I want you to clarify, if you can, how you justify being a conscientious objector in those circumstances? It's always difficult to understand questions sometimes acoustically. Um, so you, you think if the entire population is in favor of going to war, how difficult it is for conscientious objectors? Uh, no, it's how the conscientious objector responds to his family group, I mean, because of course families were broken up by this, uh, and they were saying to him, if we all did this, we would lose immediately. So you are looking after your conscience and letting all your fellow guys go out to get shot. And it's quite difficult psychologically to deal with that uh, questioning. Now you, you, should, you should probably prevent that situations like that emerge in the first place. Um, that is, there should be a sufficient number in a country who holds the opinion that we are not going to war against another country and uh, we are not collective enemies or collective friends with somebody else. Yes, if you have a situation where the overwhelming majority in one country wants to go to war and, and you uh, resist it, um, then the best thing is somehow to, uh, yeah, to be a fellow traveler, to do absolutely nothing. Um, I mean, you, can, you don't have to volunteer to go to war, even though all your neighbors do go to war. You can tell your kids, no, we will not participate in that, even though all our neighbors and your friends do go to war. If you have a situation where the overwhelming majority is in favor of it, doing it, uh, then all you can do is try to stay private as long as you as you can uh, protect whatever is dear to dear to you uh, and hope that the whole thing goes over uh, and uh, and you are still alive I uh, just a little uh, 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 something to add there's a very nice movie of an Italian director, Uomini Contro, about World War I. It's one of the uh, hardest anti-war movies that were ever made, and in fact he was tried because it was an offense to the Italian army, the movie, and he was then, he was acquitted. And in a scene of the movie, one of the soldiers says, we are all armed to the teeth. What we should do is point the, the, the guns, not to the Austrians on the other side, but to our officers behind, and the, uh, the war would end in a minute. This should be the attitude, no matter what, what uh, the other people think, because war is always a useless slaughter. So uh, even if you are just one conscientious objector against all the rest of the country, you're still right. That's, it doesn't matter what the other think. But nonetheless, you, you, might want, don't, you might not want to risk your own life if you know that you are completely alone. Even, yes, you can shoot your officer, but you know then they, they, they will uh, retaliate. So you, there has to be a realistic assessment of what the situation is. Um, in my speech that I give on, uh, on Sunday afternoon, I will address these, these problems uh, to a certain extent. Yes, sometimes the best thing is I give up. That's it. There's nothing I can do about it. Um, but that you, you have to make an assessment 
of the situation as it as it exists and depending on that assessment your decision might be this way or that way but in any case I would recommend that you try your very best to stay out of out of all of this uh, sometimes that is all you can do just if I have if I have a big bully living next to me uh, sometimes the best thing is just simply say I I have to just be on peaceful terms with this guy. I hate this guy. I wish the guy would be dead. Um, but I'm not in a position that I can kill him. He will likely be more successful than I am. Well, I was just about to say that turning, uh, turning guns on officers didn't seem to work very well in Russia, if I remember right. Uh, a critical question to Hans and then I'd really like to get Anthony's view as well as about the historical narrative. Uh, Hans, you talked about how a Ukrainian libertarian should see the whole thing. Uh, now I know quite a few Ukrainian libertarians and Russian libertarians as well and uh, maybe surprisingly maybe not, not a single one I've talked to agrees uh, to this kind of radical neutrality but interestingly all the Ukrainian and Russian libertarians I talk to agree with each other on uh, seeing the Putin gang and the society surrounding it as the bigger threat and the Russian libertarians rather leaving Russia and the Ukrainian libertarians rather staying in Ukraine. Uh, are you demanding something utterly unpatriotic and unhistorical of them or uh, how do you explain that anecdotal evidence I'm trying to share with you or have you met a single Ukrainian libertarian that shares this approach or is able to remain neutral I do not know every Ukrainian libertarian. I'm pretty sure that they have different opinions uh, when it comes to some of these questions. Obviously, a libertarian living in the Donbass might have a very different position than somebody living in, uh, in uh, Le the old Lemberg or Lviv, Lviv as it is uh, called right now. Um, the U Ukrainians are not one homogeneous blob of people. Um, so some of the Ukrainians have no interest whatsoever at the Donbass, and they would be gladly giving it up. Others are of the opinion we have to defend the borders under all circumstances as they exist historically, even though historically, of course, the borders of the Ukraine have continuously shifted. Um, the Soviet Union was the one who gave parts of Slovakia to the Ukraine, they gave parts of Romania uh, to the Ukraine, uh, the, 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 from Poland parts of, were taken away and given to the Ukraine. Now to pretend that all of them have identical interests uh, is obviously wrong. Um, so I would just simply say to these, to these people, do you care about all of the Ukraine? Give me an argument why all of the Ukraine in the present borders has to be defended, or are you actually only interested in whatever, defending Galicia, um, which was traditionally part of the Austrian Empire, for instance. Um, so the same thing applies by and large to a country like Germany. Not all Germans have the same idea about what Germany should be like. Germany existed in, in the 19th century, consisted of, of 39 states. Most of the people identified with very small units. They did not identify with all of Germany. Um, so to them, I would simply say, what, what is your objective? Uh, what part are you willing to defend? If you are willing to defend the, the entire Ukraine as it is right now, then, then, I, then I think you would make a big mistake insofar as you override the will and the wishes of large parts of the population who would rather want to have a rather different solution to this conflict. It, good afternoon and thanks for the talks. They were amazing, the ones that I managed to catch. Um, from a from a practical perspective, what is the panel's opinion on what is happening in New Hampshire in terms of the Free State Project moving oodles of people into the state to take control of the local politics? 
Thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> well, the, the Free State Project of uh, New Hampshire, the, the Free State Project of New Hampshire is very interesting. The idea is very simple. It's the idea: let's move as many libertarians as possible to one state in the U.S. And so, even without doing anything and with the same legislation, with the same uh, structure, we will affect some changes. We had a similar idea in Italy. There are very small uh, cities where you have 30 people living there, and they even give you money to, to if you go there and take up your residency there. And we thought we could move there a thousand people, and we uh, set up a, a libertarian city. The the mayor could make all uh, police officers, so we could be all armed. And uh, although it is forbidden in Italy, so. It's, it's an interesting model of trying to do something. I think no one has the right recipe to, to set up freedom in, in our unfree world, as Harry Brown would, would phrase it. Uh, but anything goes. And uh, just a, a little note on, on, the, on Rahim's question. I think we must stop being attached to national states. National states are just an artificial construction of, of uh, of historical forces which are way beyond what we believe, at least we, we libertarians believe uh, about how, how, uh, how you should live in society. If I am Ukrainian, Russian, it doesn't really matter. Ukraine, for example, was the theater of, a, of a, an ongoing war about languages, and both parties, the Ukrainians uh, forbid the people to, to speak Russian and vice versa, and there have been shifts in population. So to say that there is some sort of unity, but this is true of any country. I come from Italy. Italy is not one country. It is an artificial construction which was organized by mainly by the British and French Secret Service in the in the 19th century and we okay we share some common cultural heritage and maybe a little bit of common language and that's it and the best way for Italy would be to to uh, explode in many different states and and I would say in many different individuals sovereign individuals and this could be the way out of of the mess we're in I made that I made that point the decision to go to war and what war to conduct, in which way to conduct it, should be done on, on the smallest scale possible. Um, yes, sometimes you have no choice. You have to just do what the central government tells you, and then you just give up. But nonetheless, yes, of course, I would defend the village in which I live. Uh, I would even take up weapons in order to def defend my immediate neighborhood. But whether I would defend some, somebody living thousands of miles away from me that I have never met and who might have committed all sorts of provocations against other people to go to war for fools that have caused these types of problems, that I would refuse. It, in the, on the small scale, everybody knows what they would defend. Of course, everybody defends their wives, their kids, and things like this. But I don't necessarily want to defend the wives and kids of people who might have committed uh, rights violations that I personally uh, despise. Uh, and this is what you have, of course, in all collective big-scale wars going on. Uh, you know, Ukraine is not one homogeneous blob of people. Uh, they, have, they have people that have very different views of who is right and who is wrong. Uh, and yes, the first insight always has to be, we do deal with gang leaders on both sides. Uh, none of them loves us very much. None of, us would, none of them would help us in any way. Why should I help any of them in their conflicts that they have with other gangs? If, I, if they force me to do it, yes, I might, I might do it. If they say, I kill, your, I kill your wife, I kill your children, unless you now fight the Russians or fight the Chinese or whatever it is, yeah, then I have to make a decision, will I do this or will I not do this? Uh, that requires, in any case, it requires a decision that, 
that you have to make for yourself in some specific situation at some specific location where you are and based on the assessment of what the world is like, who is on whose side, who will come and rescue you or who will come and attack you if you do such and such. There is no yeah, there, there, there's no uniform recipe that works in, in all sorts of situations. Tony, if you, please, if you want. <laughs> well, all I can say is I wish you luck defending your house against tanks. <laughs> oh. No, but they are, again. If, if the tanks are there, they're there. No. Again, I, this will be a topic that I will bring up on, on Sunday. Uh, it depends on small, every attacker needs support in public opinion of his own population, so to speak. Um, without some reason, you cannot persuade any population to support going to war. There must be popular opinion behind it to a certain extent and you need an excuse small units give you very little reason to attack them uh, why don't people attack Liechtenstein this is, I mean, this is a teeny country you the, the Swiss could roll over there in in one day and take it over uh, the Germans could take over Luxembourg in one day uh, why don't they do it because they would not find any support in public opinion in Germany that would justify such an attack. The people would say, why in the world would we attack Luxembourg? Why in the world would attack Switzerland, uh, Liechtenstein? Um, so the smaller the units are, the more difficult it is to find a justification for it. The larger the units are, the more easy it is to find a justification. They just do some, they mistreat, in, in the Ukrainian case, they mistreat the Russian-speaking population. Okay, of course Russia has an excuse now to come to the rescue of the Russian-speaking population. Um, so the smaller the units, the more difficult to find an excuse to attack. And people do need an excuse for, the, for an attack. Um, <laughs> I mean, even, even, in, even gang attacks in cities usually have some sort of justification why gang A uh, starts beating up gang B or, or vice versa. Um, I, see, I see your point, but uh, again, um, there, is, there is no, no uniform recipe in order to prevent any type of war going on, the only thing that we can do is minimize the risk of wars. And to minimize the risk of wars, one method of that is to decentralize the, the political units, uh, because the smaller they are, the less, the more difficult it is to find a reason to to go over and attack them. Uh, I have a question for Professor Hopper as well as uh, the other two speakers. Um, in your lecture, you mentioned about um, the underperformance of uh, the Ukrainian, the economy of Ukraine uh, as versus uh, Bulgaria or other Eastern Bloc countries. Uh, but one uh, past uh, this conference, a past participant, he told me um, is very important for Ukraine to join NATO, not necessarily the EU, but NATO, because without the security guarantee from NATO, there wouldn't be long-term investment, like infrastructure, you know, going, talking about like more than 20 years of commitment. So that explained the underperformance of uh, Ukraine versus the other countries. Uh, so what is your take on that? Now, not all countries uh, joined NATO. Switzerland is not member of the NATO, for instance. Austria is not member of, of NATO, for instance. Uh, 
NATO, I think, did have some um, rationale as long as the Soviet Union existed as some sort of at least alleged, allegedly uh, defensive uh, alliance. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, the raison d'etre of, uh, of the NATO basically disappeared. Uh, what the Russians did, the, the Russians withdrew all their troops from East Germany. I mean, keep that in mind. The Russians, all the troops, East Germany was occupied with Russians. They withdrew all the troops, not a single one was left. The Americans did not withdraw their troops from West Germany. They still have atomic weapons stationed in West Germany. Um, so NATO basically had no reason to continue on after the collapse of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union also withdrew all of the troops from other countries that they previously belonged to their uh, empire. Uh, there, was no, there were no Russian troops anymore in Poland. There were no Russian troops anymore in, in the Czech Republic or in Slovakia, as far as as far as I know. There are no Russian troops anymore in the Baltic in the Baltic countries. The war the Warsaw Pact was dissolved. Um, the Russians could have said, "Okay, we just as you keep NATO, we keep the Warsaw Pact." They didn't do that, and NATO made promises to the Russians that. That they would not expand NATO to uh, further to the east, and even though that was not fixed in some um, uh, agreement, official agreements, um, it was the understanding of of the Russians that there would be no eastward expansion of NATO taking place, and in fact, of course, it has taken place, and. Russia was yeah, surrounded increasingly by NATO, by NATO members. And, uh, and that NATO is not a defensive organization was also proved by what they did in, Ser in Serbia, for instance, where there was something similar taking place. Provinces wanted to secede and something like this. And there they just uh, went in and uh, and attacked attacked the Serbs. Um, they had basically the same uh, justification, or the situation was in, in, uh, basically the same as uh, as uh, in, in the Ukraine case, uh, except that in in the uh, in the Serbian case, of course, it was a good good thing that they intervened. In the in, in this in this situation, it was considered to be a bad uh, bad act. Um, and as far as the economic development is concerned, look, you don't need to be a member of the NATO in order to economically develop. Um, as I said, Switzerland is the richest country in Europe, uh, has never been a member of, of uh, NATO. Um, that the Ukraine is the worst of all of these countries indicates that the, the level of corruption in that country is much higher than it was, for instance, in the Baltic countries. The Baltic countries, yes, they are economically far more successful than the Ukraine. Um, they became free of the Soviet empire at the same time. Um, so you can be successful as a small country. Liechtenstein is even more successful than Switzerland is, and is even smaller. Um, that, that the Ukraine ranks below Albania. Albania is also not a member of the NATO, by the way. Um, that, that, is, that is a striking performance that, in, that indicates that the, in terms of corruption, Ukraine is no better than Russia is. I'm not saying that Russia is a great country or anything like this. Um, I'm just saying the difference between the two is not all that great. Um, they are used to widespread corruption. And there are large regions that, w that wanted to be part of Russia or at least 
wanted to have granted some autonomy to speak Russian in these territories and not be told by Ukrainians, no, in schools, no, Russian can be taught anymore, Ukrainian has to be taught, and so forth. U the Ukraine is an artificial place, um, and there are, uh, I mean, look, one of the big heroes in the Ukraine is Stepan Bandera. Um, Stepan Bandera uh, cooperated with the Nazis when they invaded uh, the, so the Soviet Union at, at that time. Stepan Bandera had three goals. Kill as many Russians as possible, kill as many Jews as possible, and kill as many Poles as possible. He wanted to have a homogeneous Ukrainian nation. When the Nazis discovered that he did not want to be a protectorate of the Germans, but wanted to have a purely Ukrainian place, then they arrested him, put him in a concentration camp. He survived it. He died in Munich. He is considered to be a hero in, in the Ukraine. They have monuments erected for him, streets named after him. The German ambassador, or the Ukrainian ambassador to Germany, uh, who is now the vice foreign minister for, for the Ukraine, Melnik, was one of the most impudent person in, the United, in, in Germany, always demanding this and insulting all sorts of people who were of different, different opinion. Under normal circumstances, he would have been immediately expelled from, from the country as, a dip, as he, he worked as a diplomat. Um, he, he went to the grave of Stepan Bandera in, uh, in, in Munich and celebrated him. So th there are some reasons to, to be skeptical about this view that yeah, the Ukraine is a Western country, they, de they defend the fr our freedom and so forth. They don't defend anybody's freedom. Um, they kill their own population in en, en masse. Um, Zelensky has arrested all sorts of oppositions. Um, he doesn't do anything differently than what Putin does in, in his country. So why should we be so one-sidedly in favor of the Ukraine and at the same time preach nothing but hatred and hatred and hatred uh, towards, uh, towards the Russians? Um, all sorts of people were dismissed and invitations were revoked from Anna Netrep, was this, the, 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 famous, the fam famous singer. Um, they, they canceled most of her contracts because she had once met Putin and, uh, and didn't distance herself from, from Putin sufficiently. Um, nobody has ever uh, distanced themselves from any Ukrainian who has committed these types of atrocities uh, that they have committed en masse, just like the Russians do. So treat them equally. That's, that's what all I'm asking. Just, just a few words. I, I don't think that belonging to a military alliance can have any uh, connection with uh, economic development, or at least not directly. And then I'm very skeptical about the, the, the phrase economic development. What sort of economic development? In our world, uh, capitalism doesn't exist anymore, and so uh, economic development in, in, uh, in a normal fashion doesn't exist as well. We live in a world of cronism, of, uh, of privileges given to certain uh, industries, of a huge financial system which uh, lies on top of the real economy. So what is economic development anyway? Uh, I, I remember a famous interview by Milton Friedman in 2003. He visited Italy and the interviewer asked him what were uh, the strengths of the Italian economy and he said tax, um, tax evasion and black markets. And this should be our attitude. Black markets are true markets, all the rest is just cronism. Alessandro, thank you for your speech. Outstanding. I wanted to direct your attention towards the end. You made m mention of the psychological mechanism as the key line of effort. And within that 
First is the exposure to better ideas, and second would be civil disobedience. And I think you're really spot on with that. Even under official security dialogue, think tanks, and initiatives, there's a focus now on cognitive warfare, this term that's being bandied about quite a lot. So even the state is focusing on that cognitive aspect in an overt fashion. And with that in mind, what is the method of breaking out of conditioning? And then second, would you also place any type of institutional arrangements, changing institutions within society, if you had any goals to move towards rather than just breaking existing conditioning and civil disobedience? Well, uh, psychological c conditioning is the, the main instrument of ruling. Um, uh, I cited um, Desmet's book about the psychology of totalitarianism, and there he um, he quotes a, a book by Ellen Berger about the about the, um, the um, uh, unconscious, and he uh, quotes a very interesting studies about the shamanic deaths. So, in in certain primitive villages, the the shaman. Uh, uh, kills you by, by enchanting, by, by saying some, some enchantment. And um, he, sa he sa uh, says that the victim actually dies because both the whole village, the victim and the shaman, they are all uh, convinced that there exists this power. And this is exactly the same situation we have. We are not much different from the, the primitive dwellers of villages. We have a whole big... Uh, superstructure which was religious until a certain time and now it's way more complicated with all our institutions and, and democracy and all these things but at the end of the day it's still a psychological uh, way of conditioning people into believing that they have to obey that they're that the ones who have the titles of presidents of rulers of ministers and so on have the right to to uh, demand obedience from you so disobedience is the first thing. Uh, institutional changes. I think uh, the, the single uh, most dangerous institution which uh, hampers our freedom and where I would begin, at least, uh, it's, it's an impossible task to, to change this world. So uh, we always turn around the same problem. But anyway, the, the single institution where I would begin are central banks. Uh, in fact, there is an experiment going on now uh, in Argentina. Uh, there is a, a libertarian, an outspoken libertarian candidate, Javier Millet, and he pledged that the first thing he will do is abolish the Argentinian central bank and dollarize uh, Argentina, or better to say, try to establish a, um, a free money situation like in Hayek's book, The Denationalization of Money. This could be an experiment. Anyway, uh, taking away the power from central banks and from financial institutions could be the way to begin. It's hard, it's close to impossible. Uh, I am very skeptical as well, uh, as Hans told us uh, today about the project of uh, establishing a new currency of the BRICS countries somehow uh, um, uh, tightened to gold, but it's very difficult, but still, this is the first and fundamental question, in my opinion. I, I want to get briefly back to Tony's remark, that how do you defend, defend yourself if they come with a tank? But how do you defend yourself against your defenders who also have tanks? Um, I mean, Zelensky also has tanks. Uh, and he comes, if you don't participate, I smash you with my tanks. And, the, and Putin says, I smash you with your tank, with my tanks. So it is, yes, it is. I cannot defend myself against a tank, but I cannot defend myself against a tank of my own people either, who defend the entire nation. Just briefly, I pass you. I think the Second Amendment should extend also to tanks, so you should be entitled to have a tank. <laughs> Uh, or, uh, again, I would say, uh, life is a, a, a often a tragic choice between two bad alternatives. And, uh, uh, but there may be a better and a worse alternative. So when I vote, I don't vote for the person I like. 
I vote for the person I least despise. Yeah. Okay, but that's but that was my point with the Ukrainian people too. They should they should just be left and make the decision who they despise less. And I'm not sure it will be always, the answer will be always Putin. It will be very frequently also, I despise Zelensky even more than Putin. I mean, I, I agree perfectly. That there, is, there, is, there is no recipe that we can avoid these things entirely. And sometimes there is no way that we can make a decision that makes us perfectly happy and perfectly safe. Uh, we must make, in life, we must make compromises that are sometimes, uh, yeah, uh, to, no, to nobody's, personal, nobody's personal liking, but uh, appear more suitable in this situation and less suitable in others. I don't think we have much of a disagreement on all of this. Okay, I have a question for uh, Alessandro. Uh, I really enjoyed your lecture on uh, sovereignty and the state of exception. I have uh, my question is twofold. First, about Schmidt. Do you think Schmidt's view that the sovereign is he who decides the state of exception? Do you think that view applies only to the modern Weberian nation state that arose after the Reformation? Because, as you know, in the Middle Ages, um, such I mean, Sch Schmidt himself says that the the whole you know the, the phenomenon of sovereign dictatorship arose during the French Revolution. So the sovereign is also the dictator. This, didn't, this uh, concept of sovereign dictatorship didn't exist in the Middle Ages. So my first question is, do you think uh, Schmitt's, perhaps we could even say his understanding of politics, is attributable only to the modern you know, Weberian nation state, or can you generalize it to all states, including pre-modern states? Um, and my second question is, what do you think about um, the classical legal tradition. So the classical legal, legal tradition says that the purpose of law, that law should be oriented towards the common good. Um, and this is the, an idea that you find in Aristotle. Um, with you know, political modernity, you get the idea that, uh, with Hobbes, for example, Hobbes says that um, lex, the transfer of rights to the, the absolute state, occurs because in the state of nature, men are warring with one another. And the state rules by brute force. They surrender to the law, which is a kind of, you know, and all positivistic conceptions of law arise from this. Whereas the common good tradition, uh, or the classical legal tradition, which emphasizes the common good, says that all laws um, should be established in such a way that um, all laws, that the purpose of, all, of law is to allow for the flourishing of the, of the political community, to allow for the realization of the common good. Um, and I asked this question because you said the purpose of the law should be to protect our liberty, um, but the conception of liberty that you um, pro I proposed in your lecture or, or talk, I, I think, was a kind of negative conception of liberty, whereas the common good, um, the classical legal tradition views liberty as positive. It's, it's the ability to realize one's uh, inner possibilities. Um, which pertains to the whole political community and ultimately the political community seen as having one shared common good. Um, you find this in Aristotle and St. Thomas. So, yeah, those are my two questions. What do you think about, is Schmidt's thesis applicable to pre-modern states as well? And what are your views um, on kind of, yeah, the classical legal tradition? It's called cl common good constitutionalism now in the United States with legal theorists like Vermeule, Adrian Vermeule. Just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Uh, well, yes, Schmidt is quite clear about the fact that he thinks that the idea of sovereignty um, uh, harks back to, especially to Jean Baudin and his uh, book about the Republic and uh, to Thomas Hobbes. So uh, he says that it is a, a modern conception. Uh, in fact, <clears throat> the, the medieval states uh, with, the, with this uh, diarchy between uh, kings or emperors and the Pope on the other side uh, with an inbuilt uh, mechanism of, of limiting the power of the, of the political uh, rulers uh, was quite different. Uh, so the, the, the king in the medieval tradition was subject to the law and uh, the law was represented mainly by religious authority or religious principles. And so the, the medieval ruler was never a ruler in the modern sense. In fact, 
making up laws, you could say making fiat laws as we have fiat money, was not in the realm of the possi possibilities of for a medieval ruler. So it was completely different. And Schmidt is quite clear about this uh, derivation of the modern sovereignty uh, from, from the, the tradition of the 17th century. And, in fact, uh, he sees an acceleration after the, the French Revolution, which, in fact, uh, not only the French Revolution, but let's say that, that it's, it's the paradigm of, of uh, getting rid of the personal sovereign and substituting the personal sovereign for an abstract concept. And in this, at this time, and with the rise of democracy and of modern states, you have these uh, gangs of robbers who, who uh, are in competition against one, one another in order to not to be the, the, the owners of the, of the states, as, as uh, Hans Hoppe said in his democracy book, but just to reap all the benefits, to, to, to be the usufructuaries of, of the states. And this is one of the reasons why we are in the, in the present situation. Um, as far as uh, the second question is concerned, uh, I don't think that the uh, common good approach is, an, is a good approach to define law and to, to find a solution about the problem of law. In fact, there is uh, the famous uh, definition in, in uh, Roman law, uh, which is jus um, est uh, ars boni et equi, neminem ledere, sum cuique tribuer, which means uh, the, law is, uh, uh, the law is the art of, of good and, and equity. It's the, the precept never to harm any, any other human being and to recognize private property because to recognize to anyone what is his means uh, respect for a private property. So this definition is very close to what we define the non-aggression principle. And so I would say the, the purpose of the law is not the common good, but it is the individual good. It is the defense of individual rights. And with this in mind, you can establish a just legal system, in my opinion. And just, just a word about the purpose of law. The purpose of any norm is in a way to avoid conflicts among people. Uh, the purpose of law is to make it possible that peaceful relationships exist between different individuals with different interests that they have. And there, I think, what the modern libertarians do is they did not really discover anything new. Um, the basic rules are really simple. Uh, that is just every every person is sovereign as far as his own body is concerned. Can do so to another person's body only if he is asked to do that. That is one element of making for peaceful relationships. The second is if there is scarcity in the world and people can fight over who is the owner of this or who is the owner of that, then if we want to have peace from the beginning of mankind on, then the idea, Locke's idea, basically applies what whatever has been unowned before becomes owned by the person who makes first use of it, because only the first user can acquire this thing peacefully, because there was nobody else there, and then transfers of property have to be voluntary, and all present ownerships of people must go back either to original appropriation, which does not longer exist by and large, that we have passed that age, or through voluntary exchange. There are then, of course, sometimes questions, did, did that originate that what I own right now in this entirely peaceful way? And there the rule has to be, whoever holds it presently has a better claim and anybody who comes along and says no that had been stolen from your from my grandparents by your grandparents and because of that you don't own it then the proof has to be or the burden of proof has to be on the person who disputes present ownerships um, so any type of proof when people say yeah Look, I mean, once upon a time, uh, the Rhineland was occupied by 
by Romans, uh, and they took it away from some Germans. Um, yeah, we, w that might well be the case, but the person who claims this right now must show that he is a direct descendant of the person of the German person that had been exploited by the by the Russians at that time, and and there, there the question is simply a time question. Um, in East Germany, for instance, uh, when the expropriations were taking place, records existed of what people owned before. It would have been easy, for instance, for East Germany to restore the original owners to their property because they had titles. It was far more difficult to do that in the Soviet Union because the time when they took over was far further back in the past and lots of records simply did not exist anymore. So there, how you privatize, for instance, collective property is a more difficult question. We have, I mean, Rosbart and I have written on these questions too, how that can be resolved in a way, but it is completely different from a situation where you have clear records. Um, the, the, the reparations questions, for instance, of, of slavery in the, that they start in the United States. Yeah, it is, it's simply, in most of the cases, it's simply ridiculous. You, you, you cannot show that my grandparents did this to your grandparents, I'm the direct descendant of this, and because of that, that is my property. These are just all vague, vague claims. I can claim any, any type of thing I want if that is the only thing that you have to show. The burden of proof is on those people who just want to change the current uh, current uh, arrangement of, of property. And what we all can do nowadays is, of course, say, yes, the taxes that the government collects and out of which they pay their salary, those are things that currently happen. So I can clearly show they have no, no, no government official in Germany, in England, or in the United States has title to any of these things that they take away from me. None of them. They, they, they do not, we cannot show that I'm the, we are the owner of Germany. Where are your documents that you are the ones that have some claim to Germany as it is? Has any person ever conducted a contract with you that stipulates that 10%, 20%, 50% of your earned income you have to deliver to me? And the answer is no, they can't do that at all. But as I said, things that happened way back in the past, they are, they, the past is past. There is not much to do unless you can just present clear-cut proof that you were harmed by this and, uh, and you go down the line and say, here it happened and this is actually, these are actually stolen goods and because they are stolen goods, they have to be returned to me. So I think the, the, pur the purpose of law is to make peace among people. Um, and the rules how to make peace and how to create peace from the beginning of mankind to the end, the rules exist. Yes, people break these rules. And then we have to find a way how to deal with people who break the rules, how to deal with criminals and how to deal with states, uh, how to deal with uh, bullies next door, how to deal with attacking uh, attack w w w warring countries and so forth. Um, but what is needed in order to create peace, what sort of rules should exist, is by and large clear that there are cases where certain, um, yeah, certain problems arise. For that we have lawyers and judges um, who look at the case specifically and investigate exactly this is what happened this is the witness that he has, this is the witness that he has, and so forth. Um, but, um, uh, but the principles of creating f peaceful relationships among mankind d d d d are worked out by, uh, by, by countless theoreticians for, uh, yeah, f for hundreds of years. Um, 
I mean, they say, I, I'm not in complete agreement with, with Locke's views, but, but essentially he is right. Uh, to hear um, a psychiatrist uh, talk about history and to witness uh, last year during PFS um, a um, student of Hulsman give a lecture about supposedly economics, but it was merely empirical research which, ha which had no theoretical or useful knowledge at all. I want to ask the question, um, what is your attraction to history? Because um, to me it seems that um, for economics it's clear that we do not need history to, to derive uh, the rules of praxeology. Economics is, 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 can be known with, without testing. Yeah, that is like logic or mathematics. Yeah. You, don't, you yeah. don't need any type of history to yes. it. So yeah. also, to live a good life, the patients come to you as a psychiatrist with moral problems, ethical problems, psychological problems, and I understand that a lot of the, of, of, of the, of the problems are to give some kind of meaning to the past. But um, in essence, isn't uh, finding out what is moral, finding out what, what is the good life for you, isn't that also in essence uh, a priori? Uh, like, doesn't the knowledge of, of, of how to live a good life has its epistemological basis uh, in a priori reasoning, like uh, rational philosophy? Do you not understand another person just as good as you understand yourself? Doesn't any testing and any testing, any experience on sich cannot bring you any knowledge of the good life? Um, so also ethics, yeah? We all know here, I hope, that indeed the fundamental principle of law is that you can do with your means uh, whatever you want, and I can do with my means whatever I want. But this is not something that is testable either. You cannot go out in the world and try and see if we try it another way. Uh, if this, if, 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 I mean, we have to deduce it. Uh, and, 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 and so, I mean, I, I question um, just, I love uh, a good story. And you can learn something from a good story, but History itself, what is the attraction of history itself, and is it really, truly necessary to know anything about history in order to live a good life, in order to not harm anybody's rights, in order to live a just life with other people? <laughs> I think if you, if you don't know anything about history, I agree perfectly with you, this is like, then you are just living an animal life in a way. Um, they also don't know anything about history, um, but I'm not quite sure if I understand all all the implications of your question. I just wanted to point out what what libertarianism is is not to tell you what a good life is like. Um, they only tell you what should be punishable and punishable offenses and what should be considered to be sins or bad behavior. I, I know uh, I'm, a, I'm a controversial figure in the libertarian movement too, uh, because many libertarians tend to be uh, leftist libertarians. That they, uh, people can do whatever they want as long as they don't harm anybody. But I mean, imagine you have na neighbors who just only stink up their own, their own place. Uh, who have uh, table manners that that, um, that makes you s throw up when you see them eat. Um, so there is far more to to a decent and good life than just abstaining from aggression against other people. I know quite a few libertarians. I would not want to be their neighbors under any circumstance. Um, and I know quite a few people that are not libertarians that I consider, would I consider to be perfect, perfectly behaving neighbors uh, with whom I would like to live in, in close proximity. Um, 
So the question to what makes for a good life uh, is something where I do not feel qualified to to give a definitive answer. Um, that you have that you have to f find out find out yourself. The minimum requirement is that you adhere to these libertarian principles, but those are just the minimal requirements. As I said, uh, I have met libertarians. I would not touch them with a was a was a poll. But you could have you could have reached these libertarian principles, and we probably did without having to test it and without having to use history. So I, I suppose that we are listening to the history talks because it teaches us something else about life, which then maybe brings us to uh, closer to a better life. But then isn't uh, reaching uh, that point in uh, reaching a moral good life uh, ultimately also not testable and also just a, uh, an a priori uh, kind of science, a priori reasoning. Again, look, you need history in order to even know the options that you have right now. Um, what possible good lives are there for you in this situation? Um, you must understand what, what you inherited from your parents, what is yours, what did they be, do before, what did the neighbors of your parents do before. All of these things are important to know in order to make your decision what would be a good life for me in this particular situation. I was very glad to hear that Hans doesn't have the answer to uh, how we should live the good life. <laughs> Come on, I'm, I'm, I'm a very modest person. <laughs> but uh, I think your, your, your attitude is a kind of complete rationalism uh, which does not work. I don't think man will ever understand himself fully. I certainly hope he never understands himself fully because some people are going to have much better understanding than others and uh, you can be sure that that understanding will be used uh, for no good. But you sound rather like Mr. Gradgrind at the beginning of um, Dickens' Hard Times and he starts by saying facts, facts alone are what are needed in life. Facts are everything, and you're implying that principles are everything. Now, a man without principles is a scoundrel, but a man with only principles is a fanatic. So uh, you need experience of life, and that experience of life can be vic vicarious through uh, reading history. After all, you might start having great ideas um, uh, it's very unlikely that those ideas will never have been thought before. It's very unlikely that nobody has ever tried uh, um, putting your ideas into practice. And it might help you to see uh, that, uh, that they haven't worked in the past. And in the, in, uh, the Western world, uh, socialism, for example, has made great inroads into youth, as if no one had ever tried these things before. So I think history is of some uh, use. I, I think we, we should stop this session. No, I, Tony's remark about a man without principles is a scoundrel, a man with only a principles is, what did you say, is a fanatic. I think I perfectly agree with, uh, with that assessment. We should all take that home as, as profound advice. Uh, and with this, I will end this uh, session and remind you that uh, uh, James uh, Henry will uh, now present a little preview, a few minutes of his video on the Dutch farmer's uh, fate and uh, if you want to stay after the preview you are free to do so uh, and if you prefer to 
jump into the pool, you are also free to do that. I have no principles when it comes to, comes to this, and because of that, I don't think I'm a scoundrel. So, okay. <laughs>